Okay, everyone, welcome to class. Happy Wednesday. We've got a pretty slick demo we're going to do in just a second. We're going to finish talking about deformation mechanisms today. So our learning objectives are as follows. We're going to use the Hall-Petch equation. This is one of these seminal, really important equations that comes out of material science. And the reason it's important is because it relates things like hardness or yield strength to aspects of the microstructure like grain size. So as you heat treat your metal in different ways and you change the size of these grains, this gives you the relationship. We're going to understand the trade-off between ductility and hardness as you undergo lots of the blacksmithing processes that we talked about, cold working, annealing, recovery, recrystallization. We'll give you an equation for estimating grain growth. Ah, oh, we're out of staples, sadly. We will talk about deformation mechanisms in glasses and ceramics. And at the end, we'll talk about deformation mechanisms in polymers and some of the key factors that make those unique, okay? So uh, first off, when you take, if you're a blacksmith and you're pounding away on your hammer, with, with your hammer with, on the piece of sample you're working on, you're changing the microstructure. Every time that you smack it, not only are you introducing defects, but you're also changing the grains, right? So if you take a look at this, this is, um, this started out as a polycrystalline material that had equiaxed grains. An equiaxed grain is like a circular or a spherical grain. It's not like it's extra long in any one direction. But then they pass this through a hot roller, right? This is how they make tin foil, right? Aluminum foil. They start out with a big block of aluminum and then they pass it through hot rollers that squish it a little bit as it goes back and forth through it and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner and they keep on heating it up in this process. And if you were to zoom in on the structure, you'd notice that it starts to look like this. The grains are really long and stretched out. They've gotten quite a bit, um, their, their microstructure has changed. So what do you think would, would happen to the strength of this thing in this state? Would you expect it to behave in an isotropic way, for example? Yay or nay? What do you think? Turn to your neighbor. Should this be isotropic or not? Remind your neighbor, what on earth does isotropic mean again? Okay, who thinks they got a, got a response for me? Should this be isotropic first off? All right, let's back up. What does isotropic mean? Characteristics depend on the orientation. Opposite. Oh. Anisotropic means it depends on it. Isotropic means it's random. Or in other words, if I loaded this thing, imagine that I pull on it like this, or if I pull it on it like that, right? The stress versus strain curve that would be produced from that would be identical if this was an isotropic material. Now, do you think this is going to be an isotropic material? Yeah, no way. How come? Well, part of the way that things deform is grains sliding past one another. Another way is, remember that each one of these has dislocations maybe inside of it. And the degree to which that dislocation can move through the grain tells you how ductile it's going to be. So you might expect it to have better ductility traveling left and right, but much worse trying to go up and down because it has to, it hits a grain boundary and it's going to have to get deflected or change direction or something like that. So you would expect it to be much harder in that direction. It would be a stiffer metal and a much more ductile metal in that direction, right? So this is a pretty extreme example, but there's, there's less extreme ones. All right, this one's just about ready. Okay, so we've talked about dislocation motion. That was all last class. There's another way that you can get deformation, right? And it's twinning, okay? Twinning looks like this. We've already talked about twins. We said that in a twinned structure, it has a special type of symmetry about the grain boundary. So you've got these grain boundaries. We call them twin boundaries, but they're grain boundaries because here you've got one orientation and here you've got a different orientation and then it twins back to the original. Now the key word for these things was that it had to be symmetric about the grain boundary. So the way that this, the internet produced this image is actually wrong because these should be mirror images. So I don't know where they got this from, but it's wrong. It should be a mirror image or it's not a twin boundary. In any case, imagine if you were to deform this thing, if you were to shear it, so there's a load here and a load here that causes this thing to bend like that. 
look what happens. As opposed to an extra half row of atoms sort of inching its way through the material, like we saw with dislocation motion with slip, here you see a bunch of these atoms. It started out here, and it moved here. This atom here started there, and it moved to there. This one started here, and it went to the new lattice position. So what this is, is it's cooperative motion of many atoms. All these atoms all have to sort of shift at the same time in the same direction in order for this to happen. So what would that create? When you have a bunch of atoms all shifting in the same direction, what is that? Anybody? What? So if I'm two miles away and I take a sledgehammer and you've got your ear to a, a train track and I slap that train track rail, will you hear it? There's a good chance you'll hear that. But would you hear it if your ear wasn't touching the rail? No, because in air, you're relying on compressed air waves, right? Sound is compressions of air waves, right? And air is not a very dense medium, and so it diffuses that air wave. Like that pressure wave gets diffused, and that's why we can only hear however far we can hear. But in a solid, it's going to transmit that pressure wave much better, right? So what we have is some materials that deform via twinning is when you deform it, you literally have a bunch of atoms all moving in the same direction. That should be a sound wave, right? So this is pure tin. <laughs> I can only imagine what, what uh, Amazon thinks I am, the, the stuff I order, right? But you've got pure tin here, right? And I hope this will work. I'm going to bend it. I don't think it's a problem to touch tin. I'm going to, oh, I'm going to use that hoodie that I found, or that uh, beanie I found. <laughs> so give it a listen. We'll see if we can, if we can hear it. No, that wasn't it. Do you hear that? Like that crunching noise? You hear that? Okay. Let's see if I get up in the mic. Okay. Any, are you just like humoring me or did you actually hear it? Okay. So now let's do this. So we're going to take this um, camp stove and this boiling water and somebody's bottle. Anybody? Last chance before I besmirch it with tin. So we're going to try and not burn myself as we put this in here. So now we got boiling water in a, I don't, I'm not sure about the confidence I have in this bottle to not melt, but I'm going to put this in here and let it warm up a little bit, okay? I don't, I've actually tried this before, so I don't know how long I have to wait. Let's give it a minute. Maybe it's okay. Okay, that should be good and warm now. What we're going to expect to see is at low temperature, when I bent that thing, you could hear the crunching, crackling noise, and that's twins. You're literally hearing twins form. That's the way that it's deforming. At a higher temperature range, there's no reason to believe that the same deformation mechanism will hold over all temperature ranges. So if we grab this thing now and we bend it, yeah, no sound at all. OK? So it's completely silent. So what's different? If it's silent, that means that twinning is not happening. So what do you think is happening? If it's not twinning, what did we talk about last class? Slipping. It's slip. Now, why doesn't slip make noise? Why don't you hear slip with your ear if you put, put your ear up to it? Because think of what's happening. In slip, you had, where was it? Way back up here, yeah. Slip occurred by this extra half row of atoms slowly moving, breaking individual bonds, forming other ones, then breaking those bonds to form other ones, and it slowly moves through the material. So in other words, it's not like it's a lot of atoms collectively moving at the same time. But in twinning, since you have collective motion of lots of atoms, it produces a sound wave that you can actually hear. So what's interesting about this is that um, you, you can find these deformation maps. In fact, let's pull one up and show you. I think this will pull it up. Yeah. So as a function of different conditions, there's lots of different ways that you can get uh, deformation of materials, right? So here they're plotting the normalized shear stress. So it's the shear stress divided by something, OK? On the x-axis, they've got the homologous temperature. That's the temperature divided by its melting temperature. So if you plot your material, whatever your stress is, as a function of different temperature, you'll notice that there's sort of different regions. You can get plasticity up here. A material that's not plastic 
if you get it in the right conditions, it will be. You might get creep happening in some regions. You might get diffusional flow. You might see things like twinning versus dislocation slip. But there's different types of deformation mechanisms possible. And this is just a nice example where you can actually see it go from slipping to twinning, right? Something like this versus that, OK? All right. Um, Generally speaking, when it comes to material science, we have to have trade-offs. And one of the big trade-offs that we face is you can't have a material that's both super, super ductile and super, super hard, right, or, or strong. It's typically one or the other. Um, you can't have your cake and eat it too sort of thing, right? The, the reason for this is some of the same things that allow it to be ductile prevent it from being strong. For example, if we want something to be ductile, right, like this bar, if I want it to be ductile, then I want my dislocations to be able to move through it as easily as possible. That means that I can bend this thing with my bare hands even though it's a metal, right? Because dislocations move through this really easily. Now, the more I do that, the more dislocations pile up, so it's getting stronger and harder, but it's becoming less ductile. It's more likely to fracture. Actually, this thing's already breaking right there, right? From twisting it, okay? So you can't have both. Um, this leads us to Hall-Petch equation. The Hall-Petch equation, like the founders suggested, it's a relationship between something related to strength. That can be the yield strength or the hardness. It works for both of them. As you plot that as a function of the grain size of your material, here this is the grain size d, but it's raised to the negative 1 half exponent. So these are your smaller grains over here. No, sorry, that's larger, that's smaller, since it's to the negative 1 half. So large grains, small grains. Then you see a relationship that's typically linear with hardness or strength. Okay. Okay, um, You can model it with this expression here. The yield strength of some alloy is going to be equal to a fitting parameter, sigma naught, plus k, that's another constant, multiplied by your grain size to the negative 1 half. What's great about this is that once you figure out what k and sigma naught are, then you can figure out what the strength ought to be for lots of different grain sizes. So if you start out and your material has a bunch of really small grains, right? they're really small all the way through here, but then you do a heat treatment, and later on you find that they've grown a lot because grains grow. They don't get smaller, they get larger. Why do they get larger as opposed to smaller? Yeah, because think of all the surface area that you got rid of going from that to this. You got rid of a bunch of energy penalizing surface area, right? So it never goes the other way unless you add energy to the system, like smacking it with a, blacks like a, a blacksmith's hammer, right? That can break some of these grains up as they start to slide and, and slide past one another, okay? Um, but you can basically model the strength here. You know the yield strength here might be something, and the yield strength here might be something totally different. And you can model that with Hall-Petch equation. Any questions about this? Hall-Petch. How would you go about figuring out those constants? It's the same as anything we've done in this class. Once you get it to plot in a linear format, taking the slope, which, what will the slope give you? That's going to give you k. Once you know k, you can solve for sigma naught. Once you know those two things, you know the strength or the hardness at any or sorry, at any grain size. Yeah, promise. So does the sigma not have anything to do with it? Nope. It's just a fitting parameter. OK? Um, so I think on the last homework I gave you, I gave you, you had to combine this. You had a hall petch type of equation where you had to look at the strength. But I also gave you information on how these grains grow, right? And you can combine those. And that's a really common thing for mechanical engineers, material scientists, metallurgists to do is to understand how your strength is changing if this thing gets heated up uh, for a prolonged period of time, the grains are going to grow. What will that do to my strength? Okay. Um, there's lots more examples of that if you want to watch them. Okay. Okay. There's solid solution strengthening. We've already talked about this. This was the example of sterling steel, Ster uh, sterling silver. Excuse me. Sterling silver was pure silver that we added 8% copper to, so we made a solid solution. It dissolved in the lattice, and because it dissolved in the lattice, you had a bunch of impurity ions. And that stopped dislocations from moving as easily. Remind your neighbor, why did it slow down dislocations, having these dissolved impurities? What's that? What? The tin? That's how it sounds. It's like a crackle. It sounds like Rice Krispies. OK, why again are impurities important for strengthening a material? Anybody? Chase, what do you got? Yeah, 
the, the, key, the rule of thumb, you're going to write down anything on your note sheet from this chapter. One of the key things you want to write down is, if you make it harder for dislocations to move, you made a harder, stronger material. If you do anything to make it easier for dislocations to move, you made a softer, more ductile material. And adding an impurity, since it's the wrong size, it creates a strain field. That's going to interact with the strain field of the dislocation, and the two are going to park next to each other. And now that dislocation, it's harder for it to move because it doesn't want to leave its impurity behind. So you made it stronger, OK? Um, we've said so far that the more a blacksmith pounds on something, it gets harder to deform with each hammer blow. And that's because you're piling up more and more dislocations. The term that we use for this is strain hardening or cold working, right? Cold working, literally, the more you pound on it, the harder and harder it gets, and the more likely it is to fracture. And we can quantify cold working by just taking a couple different measurements. You can take the area. This is your initial area minus the deformed area divided by initial. That's not backwards. It's normally final minus initial. This is initial minus final, right? Or you could take the strain over strain plus 1. Either of those will give you a measure of the percent cold working. So you'll see this sometimes reported. Maybe if you buy a steel from the provider, they'll say it's already 20% cold worked, right? So they probably cold worked it by passing it through rollers or something. And they, the way that they could quantify how much is by looking at the cross-sectional area change or the strain, right? Either, either one of those will give it to us, OK? Um, so again, just like we said, tensile strength and yield strength are going to go up with percent cold working, but ductility is going to go down. And that's just because you're piling up dislocations. Now, you can also do hot working, right? When they make aluminum foil, um, maybe during the break I'll find a video of it, um, it's pretty slick. It's this giant block of aluminum that's really quite hot, not quite enough to melt it, though. And they have it really hot, and they just keep on passing it back and forth between the rollers, and the rollers get closer and closer and closer together. And this thing that started out like easily the size of this table tall turns into just an incredible length of aluminum foil because you just pass it over and over. And because it's constantly heated, they never have to like take it out and set it back in the furnace. They just keep the process at high temperature, so they can just keep on straining it. And this is because you have these processes happening at the same time. You've got, oops, you've got recovery recrystallization and grain growth all happening at the same time. So what are these things? When you plastically deform something, you increase the number of dislocations, right? When you pound on it with a hammer, you fill it full of dislocations. You're going to change the grain shape and their orientation, like we saw with that first microstructure. And you're going to get strain hardening. And then when you put this back in a furnace, you're going to get, we call this annealing. Anytime you anneal something, it's because you're heat treating it, trying to get back the properties that you had. That's annealing, right? The first thing that happens is recovery. Recovery is the internal strain being relieved because your dislocations, you've heated it up enough that they can start to move and find one another. So if I've got a positive dislocation over here and a negative one over here, they're allowed to line up and, and annihilate. So all it is, you're giving it thermal energy. So when the blacksmith puts it back in the forge, he's doing recovery. Now, if you've pounded it so much that you really, really destroyed your grains, like you destroyed them so much that there's so much energy stored into elastic deformation and plastic deformation in there, you might get the phenomenon called recrystallization. So recrystallization occurs when you heat it back up, but it was so damaged, the lattice was so destroyed that it was cheaper from an energy standpoint to just recrystallize new grains. So literally, from the, the rubble of the broken old grains, new ones will grow. It looks kind of like this, shown in this drawing, right? You go from heavily, in this case, those look like twins, maybe, but they could be dislocations. Instead, you're going to nucleate tiny new grains in there, and those are going to grow. They might start out small, and then they'll eventually get large. And it looks kind of like how you were before, except you don't have any of those dislocations or twins in it, right? So recovery and recrystallization are similar to one another. You could think of. Uh, recrystallization as a more severe or extreme version of recovery because it just gets rid of the old grain. It starts, for, starts from scratch and grows. One benefit of recovery is that you, let's say that you've been pounding on something and you ended up with a microstructure that was heavily textured, right? We say this is a textured microstructure because it's anisotropic. They're all leaning one direction. But when you get recrystallization, they're going to grow and be nice spheres again. So if you ended up with anisotropic properties because you cold rolled it, and you want to get rid of those, if you heat it up high enough for long enough, you can get rid of that because you'll grow new grains that will be nice and equiaxed, meaning no preferential direction. Okay. Um, 
So the process typically looks like this. If you were to plot the properties that you might care about as a function of amount of cold working, it goes like this. As you increase the cold working, keep on pounding on it, your ductility rapidly falls off, your strength and your hardness continue to climb, right? When you're in this state, when you put it back in the furnace, you're going to see the opposite happen. As you leave it either going to higher temperatures or longer times, you're going to see ductility regain. You pick up ductility again, and your hardness and strength fall off as you go through recovery and recrystallization. And as your grain grows, they get weaker and weaker. Why? Because of Hall Petch. Hall Petch equation said the smaller the grains, the stronger the material. Why is that the case? Why should smaller grains give you stronger material, Josh? Yeah, and think about our key, the rule of thumb from this, from this class, from this chapter was if you made it harder for a dislocation to move through the material, you made it stronger. So if you've got a bunch of grain boundaries, imagine like a student is trying to like scooch his way across the room, right? Well, when he gets to this part, he can't scooch as easily because it's, like it's awkward. He has to change directions. There's like this gap. This is probably filled with a jumble of misplaced atoms. So it acts as a barrier to dislocations. So the smaller your grain size, the more of these boundaries you have, that mess up your, your dislocation motion. So not surprising that as the grains grow in this region, it's just getting weaker and weaker, softer and softer, because there's bigger regions that the dislocations can slide through, slip through. Jaden? OK. Uh, it would depend on the sword, right? Are you making like a, a butcher knife where they want they're not going to be like chopping into someone's armor. They're going to be chopping into a carrot, right? And so you value what for a butcher's knife? What do you value? You want sharpness, right? That's ultimately what you want. A good knife is a sharp knife, and that's going to be a harder material. A harder material, when you try and put a blade on it, a really sharp blade, it will keep that blade longer, and it actually can make a sharper blade if it's a harder material. So if you're trying to make a sword that's super, super sharp, then you want it as hard as possible. But if you're making a sword, you're probably chopping into people, right? And if you're going to like chop another sword or a piece of armor or a shield or something like that, it's going to take a lot of impact. And if you have a brittle, hard material, that's not a very good sword. So they typically, they settle. They, they meet in the middle. You could quench it really, really rapidly. We'll talk about quenching next chapter. And that will give you the hardest thing possible. Or you could set it in the furnace and let it sit there for a couple days. Or you could slowly cool it down. All these are different options that will give you different hardnesses and ductilities and toughness, right? They, they all, there's a trade-off between all of them. So we'll, we'll come back to that maybe a little bit more next chapter. Uh, I don't know your name. Oh, Seth. Seth. So does heating a material back up reset the cold work? Yep. If you set it up, if you reheat it all the way and it goes through recovery and recrystallization, then you reset your cold working back to zero. Basically, it's like, it's like the virgin metal at that point. It's just how it was made originally. Is there a formula to see like, how much you can set it off? Because we don't know the exact amount of material. Uh, not in this class. There are. We won't cover it in this class. We will come cover something similar to that, which has to do with quenching of steels and then heat treatments of steel. So hold that thought for next chapter. Uh, for a couple chapters, actually. We have to get till chapter 11. Uh, Carlos? So with metal working, a lot of times people will bend the metal around the different ways to make like a Damascus steel. Yep. If you do that enough with this applied, does that mean that those grain boundaries in the steel will disappear? Uh, good question. So first off, what is Damascus steel? If people don't know what that is, that's these knives that look awesome. They look like this. The way that you make that is you take a bunch of metal, leaf springs or whatever you want to make it out of, right? You pile them up on top of one another. You clean them first. You weld them together so the edges are all welded together. And then you start pounding that thing. So as you pound it, there's literally, literally like big layers between it. So that's not the same as a grain boundary because each, each metal itself is filled with billions of grain boundaries. So instead, what you're seeing here, those lines, those are the layers between your big sheets of metal, which probably inc include surface impurities, like a little bit of oxide is on there. So that's what you're seeing there is the surfaces between those. And as they pound it and fold it, like they pound it flat, they fold it over on itself, or they'll twist it. Typically, they'll twist it, and then they pound it. You're seeing those surfaces just heavily, heavily deformed. So those aren't the same as grain boundaries. Um, grain boundaries are typically way, way smaller. That's a good guess, though. Okay. Okay. Um, so, what temperatures do you have to get up to? It, it depends on your system. It depends on how deformed it is, right? If I really deform a system, so I, I pound on it so much that this whole lattice is all broken, then I'm not going to have to heat it up as high. 
because it has a more of a driving force to want to get rid of all those imperfections, right? That makes sense? The more deformed it is, the lower the temperature that's required for it to, rec to start recovery. But if you've only def deformed it a little bit, there's just a few dislocations. If you want to get rid of those, you might have to go to higher temperatures. And the typical range you're talking about is something like a third to a half of its melting point. So steel melts at something like, I don't know, very hot. Uh, where is it? Like 14, 1500 C or something like that. Maybe, I think it's actually 1300 C. So when you do these, when you do these recoveries, they'll heat them up till they're glowing hot. When you can start C color orange, how hot is that? It's about 700 C. So you're at about half of its temperature, right? As soon as it starts to glow, it's around 6, 700 C. All right, we've already talked about grain growth. Um, the process by which grains grow is called Ostwald ripening, right? Um, the equation that governs it is right here. So D raised to the N minus D naught raised to the N equals KT. In this equation, you have fitting constants just like before. You've got K and N. These are time independent constants. You've got T is your time. So if you know K, N, and T, and how big your initial grain size was, D naught, then you can solve for your final grain size, D, right? Just by plugging into this equation. Now, why does it happen? Why does grain growth occur and how does it occur is kind of interesting. We know that it ends up with these big old grains like that. How does it actually happen? You've got a bunch of really small grains lined up with one another. So why should a big grain grow and a small grain get smaller? It has to do with solubility. So this is kind of a sad story on life, but you've got grains and the big ones get bigger and the small ones get smaller is how it works. Now, why does that happen? Right? Why on earth does that happen? If you take a ceramics class, you'll learn a lot more about it. But the main idea is this. If you look at the radius of curvature here, like if we were to zoom in and try and draw that radius of curvature, this thing has a big radius of curvature right there, right? But this thing's got a really, a really tight radius of curvature, really small. You guys see that? Depending on the grain size. It turns out that the solubility of atoms is different as a function of the grain, size, uh, grain curvature. And it's more, you're more soluble at a higher curvature. So literally, like, they're just a little bit less happy here, and they'd be a little bit happier here. So the atoms dissolve on, along the surface of these small ones, and they diffuse towards the surfaces of these big ones. And so the small ones get smaller, the big ones get bigger. I think we've got a, a simulation that shows that. Yeah, so here they start out. This is a, a computer simulation, but they start out really small. And if you give it time, see the small ones are getting smaller. The big ones are getting bigger at the expense of the small ones. This is exactly what's happening in your metal. When you, when you go through recrystallization, it starts out as a bunch of new grains. If you then proceed into grain growth region, you'll see it get coarser and coarser. So grain coarsening, that's this process. Grain, gr grain size is getting bigger and bigger like that. Okay. Any questions on this, on how you'd use that equation? Yeah, good question. N is not viscosity. K and N are just constants. They're just fitting parameters. Now there are, and if you take other classes on this, there's, there's fundamental things, like from first principles you could calculate for any given system, like it has, has to do with things like ionic size and things like that, where you could actually try and analytically predict what, how, uh, how things should course in. That's not what this is. This is an empirical model. This is just a model that says most of the time when things grow, this is roughly the dependence that they have. If you, if you can fit it to this equation, it's going to fit OK, typically. OK, any questions on metals? We kind of went through all of our blacksmithing stuff for metals. Any questions on anything we've covered so far? OK, let's keep going. So ceramics and polymers also deform. Ceramics don't deform very much. And the reason why they don't deform very much isn't because they don't have slip systems. It's not because they don't have densely packed planes and densely packed directions within those planes. Instead, it has to do with the nature of ceramics being typically ionic, ionically bound, right? And even covalent bonding has a problem. So imagine this one, right? If this is our initial ceramic, and you've got anions and cations you know, distributed through this thing, let's assume that this is our slip system along that densely packed direction plane there and up and down in that direction, OK? Well, think what happens. As it starts to slide past one another, if we were going to try and get it to actually slip, as it slides, you have to put a negative next to a negative 
and a positive next to a positive. So there's a huge coulombic repulsion happening as it slides through that intermediate state, right? If you think of this as an activation energy, between um, not slipped and slipped one unit, like one unit, if we will, right? It starts out at a low energy over here, and there's a low energy here if you could get it there, but it has to overcome a really high energy barrier, right? Because you have to get those charges of the same sign right next to each other, there's a huge energy barrier for that to happen, and so it just doesn't. Instead of that happening, it's cheaper for it to just fracture, right? It costs less energy to fracture. Now, where does energy go when you fracture something? Why does that cost energy? You created surfaces. And creating surfaces does cost energy, but that energy is less than the strain and the electrostatic repulsion that you get when you try and get slipping in ceramics. This is why ceramics don't slip, typically, right? Now, if you heat them up, uh, even ceramics that you think of as like salt or, or uh, alumina that are very, very brittle, if you heat them up enough, they will slip. Like, we showed you the deformation maps. If you go to different either shear regions or temperature regions, you can get plastic deformation, but it's very un unlikely to occur typically. Yeah, Jaden? Is that just because you're putting in that same enough energy to overcome that um, the energy still find the same charges? Yeah, I don't know exactly the reason how you overcome this thing. I know that as you heat it up, first off, they're spread out a little bit, so that's going to help. But I don't know. I, I don't have a good answer for you there. Um, now, covalent systems, let's say you're not an ionic ceramic. Let's say you're something like diamond. Diamond is not ductile either because in diamond, it's even worse actually because imagine what's happening in diamond. Instead of having this picture where it's positives and negatives where, you know, these aren't really directional bonds. There's just this positive-negative attraction. In diamond, this is a strong covalent bond. That's a carbon bond with a car another carbon. So you don't want to break that bond to slide it over. You'd have to form another bond in doing so, we have to break a really strong bond first, which is why it's also brittle. Okay. Um, now, some ceramics, when you heat them up enough, they actually, well, they might be glasses for one thing, or they might melt and become like glasses. So what is a glass? A glass is simply a solid that looks a bit like a liquid, right? A liquid means atoms are zooming every which way. A solid means you, you started to cool that thing down, and rather than arrange themselves in the exact perfect location, they're just sort of randomly oriented, right? They sort of get quenched into place. So glasses, as you heat them up, their molecular motion starts to take off. You get much more molecular motion as they warm up. And so you'll see that the viscosity of ceramics and uh, of glasses gets much, much lower as you go to high temperatures. And you've seen this. If you've ever tried to melt glass or just warm up honey, if you cool honey way down, it's a brittle ceramic, right? But when you heat it up, it flows like water, right? And it goes everywhere in between. So the viscosity is constantly changing. So the viscosity, the way that you actually measure this is with a, a, something like this. You take a moving plate and a fixed plate, and you're shearing your material, right? You're shearing it because that top plate's being dragged and the bottom plate's not being dragged. So that's going to give you a velocity profile, right? Where the stuff that's right next to the plate that's moving is going to be moving at approximately the same speed as the plate. And the stuff that's against the down here is not going to be moving at all. So this gradient in velocity, you can use that gradient velocity to calculate uh, viscosity. Okay? So viscosity, by definition, is the shear stress you're applying to it divided by that gradient in velocity in the vertical direction, dv dy, or du dy, as we've drawn it in this cartoon. Right? That's how you go about calculating this. Now, how do you actually measure it? I think we mentioned in this class, you typically put like a spindle in your liquid, and you spin that spindle, and you know how much force it's taking to spin that, and they're calibrated to know what the viscosity is. There's other ways that you can measure it. That's a common way, though. Right? And we've said that as you heat things up, they become more, uh, less and less viscous. They flow more easily. We have a nice equation that um, estimates how they perform. It's called the WLF equation. So the WLF equation is shown right there. And it basically says that the viscosity is a function of temperature. But it's not just a function of temperature. It's a function, it's an exponential one. And it depends on where your glassy transition temperature is. What is the glassy transition temperature? Anybody remember that? from last chapter, what was glassy transition? We had these glassy transition curves like this, right? We said at, say, low temperatures, it's up here in this glassy state. But there's a point at which it transitions 
and starts to become more like a leather and then a rubber and then it moves down. So this temperature right here, that's our glassy transition temperature. When it's transitioning from something that looks like a ceramic to something that looks like a glass, okay? Like a flowing glass. So if you know the glassy transition temperature, Tg, then you can calculate the viscosity at any temperature and for n not, or eta naught, you're gonna use the glassy transition viscosity. This is just an approximation but it's a pretty good way to estimate how viscosity changes as a function of temperature. The negative 17.4 and the 51.6, those are just empirical fitting parameters for this. They happen to work for lots of systems, but they don't work for everything. Okay? Now, how do polymers deform? Polymers deform um, different than ceramics and polymers because their structure is very different. First off, we learned last time that the structure of polymers is that you've got regions of tightly packed polymer lamella that fold back on one another and makes a crystalline region. But then this might be randomly connected to another region, right? So as you start to pull on this thing, there's typically a number of steps that occur. As you start to deform a polymer, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to take out the lowest energy way of stretching out possible. So instead of breaking the crystalline region, which is giving you an enthalpy bonus, right? Rather than getting rid of that, it's going to stretch out this amorphous region. So if you look at it, that entangled region is the first thing that goes. Instead of being nicely and, and tight disordered, they're going to start to line up in that region, okay? in the disordered regions. If you keep on pulling it, the next thing that's going to happen is these lamella that had been lined up like this, they're going to switch and they're going to shift to be like that. right? If they're lined up, they're shifting like that, and they give you a little extra elongation. If you keep on pulling on it, you're going to break these sections up. So you've got portions of them moving. And if you keep on pulling it even further, you'll end up with this situation where your amorphous regions are totally stretched out. Your crystalline regions still exist in chunks, but they're really lined up all together. Now you guys tell me what's going to happen to the properties of this during this process. All right, turn to your neighbor. Is it going to get stronger or weaker during this process? Okay, what do you guys think? Is it getting stronger or weaker as we do this process? Josh, what do you got? It's actually going to get stronger. Why is it getting stronger? Anybody have a guess? Want to take a stab at it? What do you think, Eric? Well, because when you're, when you're pulling this vertically, you're lining up more and more of these covalently bonded polymers together. Yep. And you run out of weak interactions to separate. And so eventually, if you want to break it, you're going to have to break the covalent yeah. stuff. So again, imagine our, our, our picture of polymers is a bowl of spaghetti. If I reach in and grab the top and the bottom of that thing and I start to stretch it out, that bunch of noodles, the very first thing that will happen is pretty easy. I'm just straightening the noodles out, right? So I'm going to get some amount of stretching that's pretty easy to get. But then once those noodles are all straightened, or some of them are straightened, and I have to start pulling on the noodle itself, then I have to break those bonds, just like Eric's saying. And those are covalent bonds, which are much stronger than the the van der Waals bonding in this amorphous region. It's much stronger when you're actually stretching those bonds. So if you want to make a really strong polymer rope, like a climbing rope or something, um, do you want it to look like this or that? Of course, you want it to look like this. How do you do that? How do you do that? So you could take, like, make the rope, and somewhere at Black Diamond, they're just, like, stretching the crap out of ropes, and then they sell them to us. Is that what's happening? Maybe. I don't think so. Yeah. 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 Bingo. This was from last class. Well, last chapter, I should say. Somewhere here at the end of the chapter, we talked about deformation, pulling of polymers. Um, and as you pull them right here, they align, right? So if it starts from the melt and you draw it from the melt, the rate at which you draw it and the, 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 the diameter of that clump can really strongly dictate the type of structure that you get out of it. Okay. So that's exactly right. Now, if you heat this thing up, what will happen? Right? You anneal it, just like you do with metals. We, we've stretched this polymer. It's massively deformed. 
right? We were able to get huge strains out of it because this happened. I heat it back up, what's going to happen? It's going to tend to go back to this because this has more crystalline regions, which are, you have an enthalpy bonus because bonus they're bonded together better, right? Now, you might have started right here. When you, when you bought your polymer, it might have been in that state where it wasn't very crystalline. It was kind of crystalline, and your amorphous regions weren't as tight as they could be. In that case, when you heat it up, it could go either way, basically. Like, you don't know which way it's going to go. You can often see the opposite happening. Almost always with metals, we think you, re you heat it up, and it goes weaker. It becomes weaker, uh, right? Because your ductility went up at, at the cost of your strength and your hardness. But you can get the opposite happening here. When you heat it up, it's forming more crystalline regions, which actually made it, uh, those crystalline regions are strong, essentially. So heat treating of polymers is not as straightforward as metals by any means, because it depends on what the whole strands of molecules are doing. You have to think about the amorphous regions and the crystalline regions. Jaden? Um, so if it's a polymer that's not a network polymer, I'm going to say that's true, right? A network polymer is something like rubber or um, like an epoxy, where remember those have, we've added cross-linking agents to have it three-dimensionally bonded in all directions. This works really well when you have these amorphous regions that have rotational flexibility to be aligned. Then you see this strengthening, this work hardening effect. Okay. Um, now polymers undergo stress relaxation. You saw us on the last homework. We talked about it briefly in chapter seven before, but again, when you load something, let's say that you, you, you draw something out, so you think you've loaded up to 100 megapascals or whatever it is. In fact, the stress that's on your polymer is gonna go down over time. This was your initial stress, sigma naught, and the stress as a function of time is actually going down by this exponential. And it's gonna, the amount that it goes down over time it's obviously proportional to time in the exponential, but it's also proportional to the stiffness of your material, that's your modulus E, and the viscosity, okay? So if you have a very low viscosity material, then it's gonna stress relax really quickly. If you have a really stiff, high viscosity material, it's gonna stress relax slowly, okay? So let's do an example of this. Let's say that you are at the glassy transition temperature and you observe a stress of 100 megapascal produces a 10% strain in a polymer, okay? So what would this stress decay to after two minutes? Give your answer in megapascals to one decimal place. So again, on this one, watch your units, and remember that a, a pascal, so let's pull up our Okay, right here, the, the viscosity at the glassy transition temperature is 10 to the 12th pascal seconds. That's by definition, approximately what the viscosity is. For all materials, as they start to transition from glassy to not glassy, their viscosity is around 10 to the 12th pascals per second. So, eta naught is equal to 10 to the 12th pascal seconds. We wanna solve for what the stress is going to be after two minutes. So we need to know our initial stress. We're going to multiply that by the exponential of our modulus times time over viscosity. Okay? So what are we missing here? To solve this question, you, I've given you time. I've told you that it's at the glassy transition temperature. So you can know what, you know that this can be plugged in right there for that. The only thing we need is the modulus, and how do we get the modulus again? That, yeah, that's Hooke's law. Hooke's law says that the stress is equal to the strain multiplied by Young's modulus. Strain is 
right? Yep. We told you that 100 megapascals produce 10% strain, so you can solve for your modulus. Okay, you should be getting something less than 90 megapascals. If you're not, there's probably an issue with your units. Remember, you have to have units cancel out. This is why we always include units. So is a megapascal the same thing as a pascal? That's probably the problem. Is that negative 12? Okay, get your answers in, and when you're done, we're done for the day. We'll pick up here next time talking about diffusion. I don't know who this is, but thank you.